Open up your Bibles to First Samuel, Samuel chapter 17. We'll begin at um, 55 and go right through to 1816. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Then, as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So Saul answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to, soul, to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house any more. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul, and Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave to David with his armour, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the, over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it happened, as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed only a thousand. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at all other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him uh, his captain over a thousand. He went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. I'd like to invite Paul up the front here, please. Well, <clears throat> David <clears throat> and Jonathan. The defeat of Goliath <clears throat> and the rout of the Philistines following key in with the shift in emphasis in the Samuel narrative from being the story of Saul to being the story of David. And so it continues for the rest of this book and for the whole of the rest of 2 Samuel as well. God has rejected Saul's dynasty as a result of his incipient disobedience and he said he would look for, they were God's words, so to speak, and find a man after his own heart. And that man, of course, is David. In just a few moments on the hills overlooking the valley of Elah, the torch of God's plan for his people and for the long-off Messiah passed from the tribe of Benjamin and Saul to the tribe of Judah and David. <clears throat> but Saul's legacy was not the only casualty of his rash and misguided behaviour. Jonathan, Saul's son, pays a greater price than Saul and in innocence. Now, I've said to you many times that there are no chapter divisions in the original languages of the Bible. That's so in the Greek, it's also so, it's also the case in the Hebrew. And we did look at this little passage at the end of 17 last week, but I want to look at it quickly again because it flows straight through into the narrative that begins at the start of chapter 18. 
<clears throat> in the end of the Goliath narrative, we read another puzzling conversation. Remember, David has been commuting between his home and court, ministering to the king's mounting irrationality and temper as he is troubled by the evil spirit from God. Saul provided David with his armour before sending out to battle. Yet despite the fact that he must have known who David was, we read in 1755 when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, and this is as David is walking out to the hill to fight Goliath, Saul turns to Abner, the son of Ner, his general, and says to him, whose son is this youth? And Abner says, as your soul lives, Lord, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Now David has been away from court for a spell, down at home with his father looking after the sheep. Uh, we talked about that last week. But he can't have changed his appearance that much, surely, for Saul and his general not to recognise him. Abner tells the king he will find out. When David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now again, this is truly bizarre. We have to accept that the scriptures are an accurate record of what happened because God inspires the scriptures and God writes the scriptures. But I can't explain it. Despite having had a conversation with David about his armour and sending him out to fight probably less than half an hour ago, Saul now does not recognise the man who he sent out to fight against Goliath probably are only about half an hour ago. And yet this young man has been in his court playing music to him when he has been disturbed. How could he not recognise him? Well, Abner is in the same boat. He doesn't recognise him either. But one person does recognise him. And that person is Saul's son. And so in 18.1 we read, now when he had finished speaking to Saul. So this follows on directly. It's in the same conversation. It's in the same room with the same group of people. And it's just a couple of seconds on from when Saul and Abner are debating about the identity of David. One man recognises him and knows who he is. And so we read in 18.1. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, that is when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now again, Jonathan would have seen David before. We need to think about why is there a different reaction now with Jonathan than what there had been before. Let's see if we can find out. Jonathan knew who David was. But his defeat of Goliath and his, retire, his triumphant return, I can't help mentioning again this bizarre, I keep using that word, but sometimes the scriptures things are at least humorous if not bizarre. David is conducting this conversation with Abner and with the king while he's got Goliath's head in his hand. Uh, we're, you know, we're talking here and we've got this thing dripping on the floor over here sort of thing. It's quite a bizarre thing. Many, uh, if, you, if you are a student of old art, I'm not, but many of the old painters painted this scene. And the scene is very graphic. It's of David standing there with Goliath's sword in one hand and his head in the other while he's talking to Saul and Abner. It is a very, very amazing scene. <clears throat> Something about David's return to the court in triumph over the defeat of Abner shows him in a different light. And Jonathan suddenly sees David not just as the musician in the court, but someone who is someone to be affectionate towards, someone who he immediately binds with in his soul. And he loved him, we said, the scriptures say, as his own soul. This is one of those light bulb moments in scripture. Now, I want you to consider with me here three things, first of all. Jonathan must surely have heard Saul's con Samuel's condemnation of his father for his frequent sin and God's sentence on the king that his son, i.e. Jonathan, would not sit on the throne following Saul. Jonathan knew that. He tells David later that he knew that, had known it all along. 
he must also have heard the following words, that God was choosing another man to be king. By inference, not another man from the tribe of Benjamin either, but another man altogether. A man after his own heart. So when we read that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul, it is a statement of incredible pathos. Because the man who he comes to love is the man who's going to take his place, his rightful place, his place as the next king of Israel. And Jonathan is going to be sidelined, and David is going to become king. But instead of resenting David's usurping of his throne, orchestrated by God, Jonathan instead aligns himself with him and has an immediate and lifelong love and affection for David, the man who is going to take his place. Now the second thing I want you to notice in this is that Saul is in denial at this point and for a long time to come. I'm sure you've read all these chapters before. I'm sure you'll read them again and we're certainly going to read them as we preach through him. Remember his failures happened in the first two years of his reign, yet he stayed on the throne until his death 37 to 38 years later. Saul reigned for 38 years in disgrace, on the siding but still functioning in the role of king, while David, the man who was going to be king, waits for Saul to die so he can take his rightful place, and while Jonathan waits knowing that when his father does die, he will not take his place, but David will take his place on the throne. He knows that David will replace Jonathan and he acts on this basis trying to kill David, of which more to follow. <clears throat> but it's a long time before he finally admits to Jonathan that he will not be king. Yet Jonathan, we'll come to that story, is more noble than his father could ever dreamed of being. And instead of seeking with his father to kill David, he acts selflessly and repeatedly to protect David and to shield him from the madness of his clearly deranged father. So when we read that he loved David, it takes a lot of love to love somebody who's going to take your prize, your place, your position, not just on the throne, but your position in history. Think about what's going through Jonathan's heart and Jonathan's mind. Now thirdly, this is a noble and platonic love between these two young men, one of the many in the Bible and the history of our humanity. It is one of many shames of our society that not only have godless and mischievous commentators implied that this was a sexual relationship, but some so-called Bible scholars have joined in that chorus. Shame on them, we say. This classically illustrates the observation that people with polluted minds think that God thinks like they do. But God tells us that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. It's a valid observation that people whose minds are permanently in the gutter are only happy when they can drag other people down there with them. Yet every man here <clears throat> and every lady I am sure has had and may still have a deep friendship and love with someone of the opposite sex without one hint of sexual overtone. I'm sure that's the case. Am I right? I remember when I went to Bible college, I walked into a room at Tali Bible College and I chucked my stuff on the bed and started to unpack my bag and another guy walked in and chucked his stuff on the bed and started unpacking and he turned to me and he said, Hi, who are you? And I said, I'm Paul Hall. He said, I'm Ken Harvey. He was one of the groomsmen at my wedding a few years later. I haven't seen Ken for 20 years, but if Ken ran me up tomorrow and said, Can you help me with something? Guess what the answer would be? Yes. Ken was like another brother to me. Wonderful man. Lovely guy. Anyway, what else does the scripture say about other people's reactions to David and to others? Is the phrase that Jonathan loved him unique in the David-Jonathan narrative and therefore something to be considered to be code for a sexual relationship? Or is it just a common saying? If we search the scriptures, brethren, we will always find an answer. Always find an answer. Samuel, when he went down to the house of Jesse, looked at all the other brothers, you remember? 
Is that the only one? Oh, we've got one more down in the field. Bring him up. Samuel has him brought up and we read that Samuel saw that he was a beautiful young man. Does that imply a sexual relationship between Samuel and David because he was a handsome, beautiful young man? We read this when David came to court. 1621, just a few chapters back, David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. Saul loved David greatly and made David his armor bearer. Does that imply a sexual relationship between David and Saul? Hardly. We just read that he just tried to kill him twice and that wasn't the only time. Between 400 and 600 men were with David for months at a time under primitive and dangerous conditions in the hills of Judea while Saul tried to kill him. Saul tried to kill him. Does this imply that there was any sexual relationships between them and their leader? Hardly. <clears throat> and notice, please, in case you're saying, well, you're just looking at Old Testament illustrations. In the story of the rich young ruler, in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, we read that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Does that mean that Jesus had a different love for him than for everybody else? Or does it just mean that he loved him as he loves all sinners who are in need of his word and his salvation? Jonathan is in fact the prototype of the many noble self-sacrificing heroes that live on in the literature. I was thinking of Sidney Carton in Tale of Two Cities. Uh, it's not quite a good illustration because Sidney Carton actually eventually lets himself be killed because of his platonic love for the other guy's wife. But anyway, it's the same thing, where a person puts his needs ahead of someone else's needs. So, as with many errors and deliberate twistings of the scripture, this scurrilous interpretation of the wonderful relationship between David and Jonathan has to be put in there first in order to get it out. And we need to avoid things that people put in Scripture so they can get them out. Because if they're not in the Scripture in the first place, they don't belong there. And we need to leave them there where they belong. So on to the narrative. David, Saul, we read in verse 18, verse 2, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. He'd been commuting backwards and forwards. When Saul needed him, he was there. When his dad needed him, he was down there. And he's going backwards and forwards. Saul now says, he's staying here now. Uh, David's the hero of the age. David's... The, the, the man of the moment, Saul wants David hanging around and bask in the reflected glory of David's conquest of Goliath, <laughs> surely. Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan took up his robe that was with him and gave it to David with his armour, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. All the signatories of being the king's son and the future king Jonathan passes on to David in symbolism, giving him the stuff that is rightfully his. How great is this love for David? Note that David had earlier rejected Saul's armour, but here he accepts Jonathan's armour. David quickly cements himself in the place of the affections of Saul and of the people. We read in verse 5, David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. Now, it's interesting. That translation, behave wisely, is done the same in the New King James Version, but it actually means was successful, prospered, got the job done. So Saul sent him out to do stuff, and he was a faithful and useful servant of the king. Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Wonderful. David's star is on the rise. But unfortunately, David is, if anything, just a little bit too successful. Well, too successful for Saul's liking anyway. Verse 6, it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine. Now, this is, this is straight away <coughs> after the killing of Goliath. Remember, the people chased the Philistines back down to Gath and to Ekron and barricaded them in their cities and said, don't come out or else. And they came back. On the way back, we read the women met them coming out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So as they chased them out, Saul said, the danger's over now, I can be the big soldier. And so he rushes off and chases the Philistines back, back to their city. And it's, the same, it's the same mentality we see over and over again in Saul, isn't it? 
So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. We read further, then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David 10,000 to me, they've ascribed only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. That means he viewed him with suspicion. You know that? I've got my eye on you. And Saul is now watching David. Saul is mightily displeased with the fact that the people are praising David, but not him. Now, I have to ask yourself in human terms, what have they got to praise David, uh, Saul about? He's done nothing. He's sitting in his tent, right, while David went out and fought his battle for him, and now the people praise David, and Saul is miffed because he only gets a little bit and David gets a lot. Well, he hasn't done anything to deserve any. But this is the irrationality of this man's mind. <clears throat> it happened the next day, he tries to kill him. The distressing spirit from God, we read, came upon Saul, verse 10, and he prophesied inside the house, and David played music with his hand at his other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. So Saul's star is sinking rapidly. It's like the aging pop star, you know, who can't hit the same notes as before, who doesn't get the same big crowds as he did before, who doesn't have the same size fan club as before. Meanwhile, someone else is taking his place in the affections of the people. David is in the ascendancy. No matter what Saul does, David comes up trump. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. Saul is afraid of David. This is a young man. Okay, he's killed Goliath, but Saul is king. But Saul is afraid of David. So he demotes him from his... You notice it says earlier he set him over the army. Now he demotes him from his position over the army to being just... A commander over a thousand men. So now he's moved him down the military food chain to be a less important person than what he seems to be. And he went out and came in before the people and David prospered wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. David behaved wisely. David still prospered as the captain over a thousand. So every time Saul puts his foot on David's head, David bobs up to the surface and Saul doesn't get what he wanted. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Twice in two verses we read that Saul was afraid of David and the writer tells us why. Because God was with David but not with him. And so despite being demoted from being the court, court musician, temporarily as we see, David is instead moved to a smaller position in the army and we will later see Saul's motivation for this strange sideways promotion of David in his court. And what we don't know is how much Saul knows of the relationship between David and Jonathan. That comes up as we read further in the story. So, how is Saul going to get rid of David? How is Saul going to get a cap on the enthusiasm of the people for David? on the love the people have for David and seemingly the disdain they have for him, their rightful king. He's going to reign for another 38 years. And the people don't love him. They want this man over here, the conqueror of Goliath. He's the hero of the day and the month and the week and the year. How is Saul going to deal with this on a long-term basis? Well, the plan is not to. So David then tries to get rid of David by marrying him off to one of his... Saul tries to get rid of David by marrying him off to one of his daughters. Now remember, this was the promised inducement for fighting Goliath. You remember that when David said to his brother, so what's the package? <laughs> I was looking at Tom when I said package, but he was looking down at his desk. Um, what's the package? Well, the, 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 you'll be advanced in, in, in the nation. You'll get the king's daughter, his, his, his wife, and his family will be exempt from taxes. So David had already been promised that if he'd go out and kill Goliath. But how is marrying David into his family going to help him get rid of them? Well, Saul might have been disturbed, but he's still cunning. Look at verse 17 of the chapter. Saul said to David, Here is my oldest daughter, Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle. For Saul thought, Let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. In other words, let the Philistines do my dirty work. Let them kill him, and I'll say, Well, it wasn't me. You know, and I'm terribly sad. You know, he was married to my daughter and it's all very, very sad, but David's gone. <laughs> David's gone. 
David feigns unworthiness, but when he's about to accept, Saul breaks his promise. David said to Saul, who am I? And what is the life of my father's family in Israel? Though I should be son-in-law to the king. But it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Maholophite, as his wife. Saul would make a psychiatrist's day, wouldn't he? Right? You could write whole theses about this narcissistic character Saul. You know, Whole books of study could be presented at university as the classic behaviour of the classic type of person. And I bet you've all met your Sauls. I know I've met plenty of them, in the army especially, I must say. Having planted the thought out there and having spited David, or so he thinks, by breaking his promise, Saul finds a rebellion of sorts, of another sort, in his own house. Look at verse 20 of the chapter. Now Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, You shall be my son-in-law today. Saul is happy to promise another daughter, but his motivation remains the same. He doesn't want David as a son-in-law. He wants David to be a target for his enemies, so that his enemies will kill him and Saul will have clean hands. He'll get what he wants without having to soil his own hands with it. David would be a great prize being the son-in-law of the king. The Philistines would love to be able to say, we killed David, the son-in-law of the king, killing one of his generals. That's no big deal. David again feigns unworthiness. He says, does it seem to you a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed? But he doesn't say no. So Saul proceeds with the plan with a twist. David must provide a dowry to the king in order to marry his daughter. Now, Saul's now got two problems, right? His son loves David and his daughter loves David. And it looks like, by the simple reading of the narrative, that no one else loves Saul. Just these two people, his own family, his own children, love David. Saul's requirement for the dowry is that David kill 100 Philistines and provide their foreskins as a proof of their death. Gruesome, I know, but... This is the sort of times that they lived in. Saul says, in effect, too easy, and provides 200 foreskins as the proof of the fact that he's killed 200 Philistines. You can just hear Saul in the background saying, curses, foil again, <laughs> can't you? Now, I'm sure you've read enough books and seen enough movies to think, hang on a second, doesn't the bride's family give the groom a dowry, not the other way around? Well, yes, but in the East, apparently, it was customary in some places for the groom's family to give the bride's family a dowry, presumably as some sort of insurance if the girl didn't like the guy and decided to call it off. Now, this isn't going to happen in this case, of course. We might almost, almost hear Saul muttering curses foiled again when his plans fail, but he cannot welch on the marriage deal for a second time, and so he consents to the union. Now both his second daughter and his firstborn son are aligned with David, and not just for political reasons, because they both loved him. And David was important to their own souls. David was important to them. Perhaps more than they loved their erratic and capricious father, and certainly more than he would be able to understand. Verse 28, Then Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, David's Saul's daughter, loved him. Everything that Saul does to endanger and diminish David results in the opposite. Verse 29, Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and it was that whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his became, name became highly esteemed. Now, I suspect that David's hand is in this writing somewhere, because David can't keep saying, David prospered, David prospered, David. It does not look like he's talking himself up. But again, that behaving himself wisely is David was hugely successful. David got the job done. He went out to fight the Philistines. He beat the Philistines. Not just by, you know, a, a, a penalty goal in the last minute of the game, but by 36 nil sort of thing, if you understand what I mean. Ladies, that's football talk. Don't worry about that. We'll get back on track here. We may wonder if we see the reputation of David interpreted centuries from his death after his death. Where did all this great mystique about David come from? Well, there's your answer. God was with him, and in secular terms, everything that he touches turns to gold. 
David can do no wrong. And Saul is increasingly frustrated by his attempts to diminish David and build himself up. And we see this as we continue on. All right, what can we learn from all of this? <clears throat> what can we learn from this story of the relationship between David and Jonathan? Well, we need to recognize that while David is a forerunner of Jesus Christ, he is not a type of Jesus Christ, as we noted in the Goliath narrative. In fact, no Old Testament character is a type of Jesus Christ because no Old Testament character is perfect, and Jesus Christ was. David is the son of Jesse, a man of God, but a man subject to the same faults and failings as other people, as we shall see as we continue on through the story. So, why is this story, indeed the whole Samuel narrative from Hannah through to the death of King David, why is it told in such fine detail? Why, if there's no New Testament lesson, and God knew the New Testament was coming, and God's going to write the New Testament, why is there no intrinsically New Testament lesson to be learned from these stories? Why are they detailed so thoroughly? Well, there's a simple answer. These were recorded perhaps very soon after the events to tell Israel and remind them of the exploits of their great king, David. <coughs> These stories are where the David, the David myth, the David mythology, the David legend comes from. These stories. Now, just let me remind you that every eastern king did this. You go down to Egypt, I haven't, but I've seen pictures. You go down to Egypt and you see these obelisks and temples and great things with writings on them. And they're all writings written by a king or about a king. And the object of the exercise is for the people to read them and say, Wow, what a wonderful king he was. How many victories he won. He is really terrific. I would love to have been alive in his time. And they all did it. Of course, they all saw themselves as gods. But it was designed to entrench their reputation. When the mysterious Queen of Sheba, who is in fact Queen Hatshepsut of Egypt, we know exactly who she is, came to visit Solomon, Solomon's scribes wrote up a description of her visit, right down to the detail of the gifts that she left behind when she went. If you go down to Egypt, and find Hatshepsut's monument, you will find her description of the same visit, including details of the gifts that he gave her. And surprise, surprise, guess what? It matches perfectly. It's like a shopping list. So she's telling the Egyptians what a wonderful person she was and how she went to this mysterious country and saw all these fabulous things. And Solomon's scribes are writing that this woman came from Sheba, which is Egypt, and Solomon showed her all these fantastic things and she was absolutely blown away by all of that. What's the point of that? What a great person Solomon was. Another queen came and visited him and said what a wonderful court his court was. She said, I've never seen the like of it. The half has not been told, she said. So these people weren't above big noting themselves in writing. And David and his scribes are writing up the legend of David. The success of this strategy is easy to see. The people loved David at their, as their king at the time, and he was revered after his death. Now, let me tell you something that I found as I went doing the research for this. He is mentioned in all sorts of contexts 56 times in the New Testament, more than any other Old Testament character, more than Moses, more than Abraham. 56 times. In the 27 books of the New Testament, in all sorts of contexts, David is mentioned in the New Testament. So the stuff that he did to cement his legend worked because a thousand years later, the New Testament writers are talking about him in all sorts of contexts. But the centerpiece of this chapter, of course, is the relationship between David and Jonathan. He loved him as his own soul. What does it teach us? Well, it teaches us that we are to obey our masters even if even if we've just had a federal election, at which I guess some of us might have not been overjoyed at the result. What should our response be? Spend the next three years grumbling and complaining and sniping and you know, crying foul and saying the votes weren't counted properly? David teaches us, David is a servant on a son-in-law to a discredited, violent, capricious and untrustworthy king. 
but David is loyal to the king because David always expresses Saul's position as being what? What does he say that Saul is? Okay, when these soldiers want to kill him, David says he will not lift up his hand. What? Against the Lord's anointed. But but he's his enemy. But he's trying to kill him. David says he's still the Lord's anointed. David is going to wait till Saul dies to take the throne. Paul and Peter both tell us that God sets up and brings down the secular powers. We've prayed about here this morning. And that we as Christians are to be obedient to them, both as a witness and as an evidence of our obedience to God. We considered that at some length recently. David obeyed his master even though he knew that as soon as Saul died, he was going to be king. But David was happy in the sovereignty of God to wait for Saul to die before he took the throne. He was a better man than Saul. He was a better soldier than Saul. He was a better friend than Saul. And a better friend to Jonathan and Saul's daughter than Saul. But Saul was still the Lord's anointed. And David obeyed God in this matter. There's lots of hidden agendas in the stuff that Saul's doing. There's no hidden agenda in what David does. David is unstintingly loyal to Saul, even though he doesn't deserve it. But most importantly, we should finish this by talking about the love that David had for Jonathan. This story, not yet fully told, it must be added here, tells us that God's people have a different relationship to one another than do the people of the world. And then they do, and that they do to the people of the world. We are not disjointed individuals. We are not separate people wandering our different ways. But we are part of the body of Christ by the new birth. We are indeed, literally, brothers and sisters. Our relationship is closer than the friendship that Jonathan had with David. They were just two sons of two fathers. Saul's world, the world's world, was one of suspicion, distrust and intrigue. David and Jonathan's world was one of selflessness, love and trust. Because God loves us and sent us his son to die for us, we live in a world of selflessness, love and trust. What is the hallmark of being a Christian? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, what? That you love one another. Not that we wear the same sort of clothes on a Sunday. Not that we go to church. Not any of those things. That we love one another. That's the hallmark of the Christian faith. We should be prepared, as Jonathan was, also to set others' needs and others' life paths ahead of our own. That's a big challenge. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, Jonathan's the king's son. Vastly more important in the overall scheme of things than David, whose initial contact with the court is to play some music so Saul doesn't get upset. David esteems Jonathan's position highly. He is still the king's son. Jonathan esteems David's position greater than himself, even though he is the king's son. Every son of every king in David's day had to watch out for someone trying to steal their position. But there was no selfish ambition or conceit in Jonathan. David was going to be king, and nothing that Jonathan could do would change that. But far from grudging acceptance of this fact, Jonathan loved the man who was going to be king. Jonathan, as the son of the king, came from royal stock, so to speak. David was just a shepherd, but Jonathan, in lowliness of mind, esteemed David to be better than himself and acted and promoted David's safety and eventually David's accession to the throne after he tragically died. I ask a rhetorical question at the end of this. How much of God's work has been marred down through the years with ambition and rivalry and selfish thoughts? Far too much. We need to be careful that the love of Christ being shed abroad in our hearts doesn't get squeezed out by ambition and putting our needs ahead of other people's needs. We are one in Christ and the love of Christ is shed abroad 
in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Let us have that same holy love for one another that Jonathan had for David, even though David was going to become a more important person than he. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. This is a truly wonderful story. It's a sad story because we know the ending, and the ending is dreadful. And Jonathan dies an ignominious death through no fault of his own, but because of his crazy father. Well, that's very, very sad. But we thank you, Lord, that this man so loved David that he put his own needs second and promoted the needs and the care of David. We thank you, Lord, that he did not do anything that he did through selfish ambition and through personal gain, but always seeking to do what he believed God wanted done. We thank you, Lord, for the example of this man. Help us, Lord, to be a people of humility, of love, a people who do not set our own ambitions above others, but that we might seek each to promote the work of God in other people's lives so that they might be rejoicing in Christ and so they may be useful in his service. We ask this today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name.